Thanks for joining us today. Uh, welcome. My name is M. Coates, and I am the student intern for EOS Eco Energy's Climate Change and Renewable Energy Week. Um, so, first off, to start, uh, we're curious to know where you're listening in from today. So, if you'd like to let us know where you're calling from in the chat, we'd love to hear about it. And I also want to let you know that this session is being recorded. So if you want to turn your cameras on, leave them off, it's totally fine, whatever you want to do. Um, and before we get started, I want to take a moment to respectfully acknowledge that our work here at EOS Eco Energy is done on the traditional unceded lands and waters of the Mi'kmaq. Today's speaker is Jeff Allerhead from the Department of Geography and Environment at Mount Allison University. So um, I will hand it over to him. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much, M. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, we'll probably talk for maybe 20, 25 minutes and then leave lots of time for questions or, or comments. Uh, I will say that the title uh, was picked for me, and that was both a good thing and a bad thing because it means I have to try to work to the title, but it actually was a good thing because it made me think about marshes in a somewhat more um, holistic or broad way uh, than I normally would. I would like to start with, um... all right, I'll use my mouse. I'd like to start with a few acknowledgements. Um, I've been working in marshes now for about 25 years, and a lot of that work has been funded by Ducks Unlimited Canada or by the New Brunswick Environmental Trust Fund. Um, I've also worked closely with um, my colleagues, uh, Miriam Barbeau, who's at the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton, and Nick McClellan, who works for Ducks Unlimited Canada. I've worked with a lot of students um, over the years. I also want to provide acknowledgement specifically to uh, Thaddeus Salonia, Robert Lyon, and Chris Parker, because as you'll see in a minute, um, I have borrowed some material from the three of them and uh, many others along the years, uh, over the years, who've, uh, who've helped me out. As I'm sure you know, there are lots of marshes around Stockville. There are both um, freshwater marshes. Uh, in behind the dikes and freshwater marshes and some of the uplands. There are also the salt marshes, which is my area of interest. And I know that uh, a number of students who've come to Mount Allison, if you tell them that we live on the ocean, of course, they look at you and say, no, we don't. Um, but if they've never been further than downtown, then they could be forgiven for uh, not realizing that, in fact, we are on the ocean and that you don't actually have to go very far um, to go over and see the marshes in front of Fort Beausajour or um, John Lesby, a large uh, a marsh uh, just over on the uh, Nova Scotia side of the border, or in fact, any of the marshes right at the end of Bridge Street, if you walk down that far. Marshes are fun, or not. I guess it depends on your perspective. Uh, as I said, I've been working in the marshes around here for about uh, 25 years. Um, they're muddy, we, we all know that. Uh, they're filled with bugs, so at various times of years, uh, it's a little less pleasant uh, working in the marshes, but they're also um, quite special and quite magical places for reasons that I'll come to uh, in a couple of moments. But as you would know, if you've been to the uh, mud flats or marshes around here, the overwhelming characteristic is mud, which some choose to gaze at from afar and others choose to get right into and lots of local kids, of course, have gone mudsliding and enjoyed the marshes um, or the mudflats in their own particular way. Okay, we've done some crazy stuff um, over the years. Um, we've uh, made all kinds of measurements in all kinds of different ways. And in some cases, we've used small boats. In some cases, we walk. Uh, we've worked in all kinds of different weather conditions. We've worked in different kinds of seasons. Um, typically, people do field work. Uh, in the summer, uh, both because that's when students are available, but also that's when it's somewhat more pleasant in some ways to be out there. Um, but I want to add that one of the things that's made my colleagues uh, and I a little bit different in terms of our, you know, broader global community of researchers is we actually get out there and work in the winter. And there's lots of people who work in marshes who've never actually seen uh, winter conditions, certainly not the kind of winter conditions that um, 
we have around, around here. Uh, and as you would know, you can get days in, in February, well, later this week, but it's supposed to be plus eight or plus nine degrees. So you can get those crazy days when it's uh, as much fun to be in the marshes as any other time of year, and there's no bugs. So what are we gonna talk about today? Well, salt marshes provide lots of different valuable social, economic, um, and ecosystem benefits. But because I was asked to talk about marsh magic, I started thinking about, well, what else is it about marshes? So I'm gonna spend a bit of time towards the uh, latter part of the presentation talking about marshes as protection um, and talking about marshes in terms of their role for sequestering organic carbon. But of course, marshes have a much wider um, appeal uh, than simply those uh, more utilitarian functions, um, shall we say. So one of the first things I thought about um, was, you know, marshes as the subject of art. So photographs or paintings, uh, marshes as recreational spaces. What do people do in marshes? They go bird watching, they do other things. Um, they're habitat, of course, for lots of different species. Uh, they do play a role in maintaining water quality. Sometimes people talk about marshes as being, uh, or wetlands in particular, as being the kidneys of the planet. So what about art, right? One of the first, um, pieces of art or work that I ever saw related to the marshes was Thaddeus Holonia's Dykeland's book. And I'm sure if you're from Sacco, many of you have seen the book or probably own a copy um, of the book. And so I've talked to Thaddeus a number of times over the years about marshes and about photographing marshes. And so he has uh, graciously given me a couple of images to use today. Um, this particular one was taken, if you are from the area, you probably realize that those are the Radio Canada International Towers in the distance, which are no longer there. Um, so this uh, photo now has both historic value and artistic value. You can see the rail line um, in the front. Uh, you can see uh, the marshes beyond the rail line. And then, of course, you can see the RCI Towers before you would get um, to Sackville. Another one of Thaddeus's um, photographs. Um, showing one of the marshes, and in this case in particular, showing one of the ditches. So this also speaks not only to the marshes as art, but also to the interaction of human beings uh, with the marshes, because in this case, um, it's a ditch which is not natural. Um, and so humans have been, uh, for at least the last 200 and some odd years, have been draining the marshes, modifying the marshes for agricultural purposes. Another one of my favorite artists is uh, my friend Chris Parker, um, who has uh, painted quite a number of really nice watercolors, uh, which I happen to be the uh, uh, grateful owner of one of them. This doesn't happen to be that particular one. This is one of her more recent works. But again, showing the marsh um, as, a, as an artistic landscape, but bringing in the bay, bringing in the sky, um, bringing in the vegetation, bringing in the colors in the vegetation. Ironically, just before I came on this meeting, I had an email from somebody who asked me if all the marsh vegetation was brown because it was killed by the salt water. Uh, this was someone in the United States and I had to explain, no, no, in fact, these are salt marshes. The vegetation is, is starts to turn brown at this time of year because we're going into winter. Well, we're in winter now, but you know, in the fall, you get, you get glorious colors um, in the marshes as the vegetation begins to senesce and begins to turn. Another one of my favorite artists who lives down the street is Robert Lyon. And Robert has painted many pictures of wetlands and uh, marshes uh, over the years. Those who know Robert's work know that he also has spent, uh, he does tremendous um, paintings of, of various kinds of uh, wildlife, particularly birds, one of his uh, specialties. And he actually painted, uh, did a painting for an interpretive poster a number of years ago, which really brings a number of these things together. So, you know, this is one of his images. It, it shows the marsh um, as art, um, but it also shows the marsh as a recreational space whereby people can go. Um, in some cases, they go duck hunting. In other cases, they take their cameras and, and take a different kind of shot, uh, whereby they're interested in bird watching or looking at the wildlife but it also speaks to the marshes as a place that is habitat for many different species of birds. Um, some may know about the ringlet butterfly. So there are various butterfly species that use salt marshes um, in New Brunswick, um, where it's the only kind of habit that they use. 
Uh, there are obviously fish that live in the marsh, then there are fish that move through the marsh as more of a transient uh, experience. Same thing with birds. Um, some birds use the marsh, they just happen to pass through. Others like the sharp-tailed sparrow, I mean, it is the habitat in which they, they make their nests and, and live. Okay, so those are the first three things. Marshes are magic uh, because they, pro they provide um, a backdrop for artistic endeavors. I also could mention um, poetry, Harry Thurston um, from just across the border, who's written extensive poetry about marshes. Um, secondly, then marshes as recreational spaces that we go to visit. Um, I'm always amazed at, at, at uh, uh, the people who will come out in any weather and uh, go bird watching. Bird watchers are a very uh, hardy breed, as far as I can tell. And then finally, marshes as habitat. Okay, what about marshes, though, from, you know, the perspective of the science um, that I'm largely involved in? So I want to speak about two things. One is the challenges with our dikes. So dike infrastructure is human made. Um, it requires constant maintenance. If you don't maintain it, it will simply uh, disappear uh, over time, particularly on the Bay of Fundy side. And so this has been a you know, an ongoing issue for the last, well, my career for the last 25 years. Um, how do we maintain our dikes? What's the future of dikes? What are the risks um, involved with our dikes? And many of you will have seen this next uh, photograph because it's been used many, many, many times, taken by Mike Johnson, but it shows the Via Rail train coming across uh, between Sackville and Amherst and the fact that the water is very, very close um, to the tracks. So what should we do uh, about this? So a number of you will have seen the or seen media reports related to this particular report. So a report was commissioned by the New Brunswick and Nova Scotia governments, co-paid for by provincial governments and also the federal government on the Chignecto Isthmus. And, you know, how should we adapt um, to climate change? And so the report, as far as it goes, it meets the terms of reference, but really it proposes one particular solution. And that particular solution is to raise and reinforce the dikes. There is no mention, at least none that I'm aware of, of using salt marshes as natural protection for infrastructure. And, you know, I don't mean to be, uh, I don't mean to suggest in any way that we will not need to raise and reinforce some of our dikes. We absolutely will. But the entire solution proposed by that report is essentially just build bigger, build the dikes higher, build them wider, put more rock in front of them and everything will be fine. Well, they're only fine in the sense that, um, uh, I mean, as long as you maintain the dikes and continue to uh, put money into them forever, um, then the solution uh, will be fine. But they don't leverage any of the magic or any of the benefits of salt marshes. So this particular photograph was taken um, down near Westcock in 2015. And that was a day where the water was coming up and over the rock and up and over the road and so on. And that was in, in 2015. And by, you know, the way these things go, it was nowhere near uh, the storm that a storm like Fiona was or Dorian. Uh, was. So, you know, would these dikes withstand a storm of that magnitude if it came from the right direction at spring high tide? Um, probably not. So why talk about marsh restoration or why talk about salt marshes as natural protection? Well, there's really a, a couple of different reasons. One is because as sea level rises, and it is rising, salt marshes grow vertically um, because of sediment deposition and the accumulation of organic matter, and they will keep up um, with sea level rise. You don't have to pour more money into them. You don't have to um, constantly adjust them in order to respond to the changing environment. Salt marshes will um, adjust to the ecosystem and the environmental parameters that they have to deal with. So as natural protection, they will adjust to a changing environment, right? In ways that dikes simply cannot. So they will baffle wave energy. 
they will um, slow down uh, the rise of the water and they will protect the dikes that are in behind. So even if you're going to build uh, new dikes or, or put money into reconstructing the dikes, there would be a lot of benefits to having salt marsh out in front um, of those dikes. As they grow vertically, um, they also sequester carbon, but I, I will come back uh, to that in just a, in just a moment. Uh, those of you who have heard me speak before know that we have um, been involved with the salt marsh restoration out in front of Port Beausager, um for the last, well, coming on to 13 years uh, now. So that project uh, was designed in 2009, 2010. And in the fall of 2010, there were three openings cut in the uh, old dike at that time. And so that area out in front of Fort Beausager is now being flooded with salt water on a regular basis. So I'm just going to share a couple of images here. So this was a, a, a photograph taken from the air by Ron Garnett um, in uh, 2011. So that would be the summer after the openings were made. And you can see the openings. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but there's an opening right here. There's another opening right here, and then there's another opening down here. So the old dike was opened up to let salt water into this former agricultural field. And then at the back here is, a, um, uh, is the uh, new dike that was built um, in behind. And so no, it, it doesn't look like much at this uh, point in time. It looks like a big uh, muddy mess. And in fact, if you had been there in the summer of uh, 2011, it, it was, I suppose, a, a big muddy mess. Um, but if you wait, if you give nature time to work, um, it will become a marsh. And so this particular photo was taken in August of 2020 um, by Sebastian Richard from uh, associated with the University of New Brunswick. And you can see now, I want you to see a couple of things. So one of them is that the old dike is basically, except for this little bit here and this little bit here, it's all gone. So without maintenance in about 10 years, uh, the whole dike is gone. And you can see the same thing over here on the other side, the original dike, the old dike after 10 years is gone without maintenance. So you're beholden if you build nothing but dikes and you put them right on the edge to um, uh, paying for maintenance forever. So these salt marshes back here that have developed, well, what's the magic of them? That, the magic of them is that they grow vertically, as I said earlier, with sea level rise. And they also, within about 70 or 80 meters, they dissipate about 80% of the wave energy, even in that length, and they protect the new dike in ways that rocks do not. They're also a whole lot less expensive than putting in rock um, every few years. But the other thing that people are increasingly looking at is how much organic carbon they sequester. So the greenhouse effect, climate change, is being largely driven by um, carbon dioxide uh, in our atmosphere. And the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere keeps going up and up and up. So when plants grow, they take in carbon dioxide and they sequester it uh, in the soil. And we're looking at these marsh restoration projects from a couple of different um, perspectives. One of the perspectives that we're looking at is how quickly they build up. So if we just go backwards a little bit, just go backwards here. And you remember this large muddy mess that I talked about in the summer of 2011. Well, this surface now in parts of it has built up over 1.2 meters or four feet, I guess, if you prefer. Um, in that 10 years. So we've gone from that to this. So in these areas up here and in these areas up here, so this area up here, all right, this photo was taken looking up in that towards Sackville, looking up into that area right there. And so that's this area right here, which is all vegetated. But 1.2 meters of sediment have been deposited in there. That's also sequestered enough stored organic carbon. If you sold that carbon on, depending on where you were to sell it, different markets pay different prices. But if you sold that carbon on the California market, especially if you sold it in US dollars, 
right? The carbon storage alone, the credits for that would have paid for the construction of this project. So when we think about um, the costs associated with the dikes or the maintenance of the dikes or the building of the dikes, when you look at preserving salt marsh or when you look at restoring salt marsh, the benefits don't just accrue from the magic that I talked about earlier in the presentation. It's not just about the marshes as artistic landscapes. It's not just about the marshes as recreational spaces. It's not just about the marshes as habitat or the marshes as the kidneys of the planet filtering water. It's also about the marshes um, providing an opportunity to sequester carbon, which we desperately need to do, and at the same time, perhaps generating income, which allows us then to look after our marsh and dike uh, infrastructure. So, what can we conclude then? Okay, so we can conclude that marshes are magic um, because they provide us with social, environmental, and economic benefits, right? And we've talked about that. Marshes can be restored if we reconnect them to nature and are patient, okay? And this has been a, not an issue here in Canada, really. It's a bigger issue in other countries where they have metrics in place and they, you know, they, they say, well, basically, we, we consider your project successful if it achieves these benchmarks by five years or it achieves these benchmarks by three years. Well, if you're gonna let nature do, do the work, you kind of gotta be patient um, and let nature do the work. And we know from our research, I mentioned my colleague Miriam Barbeau and all of her students at the UNB in Fredericton, you know, we know that even OLAC after 12 years, it has not in all of its functionality returned to the state that it would be to be considered a natural marsh. So the use by some species, for example, it's not the same as it would be in the natural marsh that's over, say, just to the east of the restoration site. But it's getting darn close. You could look at the data. And I purposely, by the way, decided not to put in a whole bunch of data slides today. Um, you know, I could have, but I don't think that helps necessarily to understand the broad brush strokes. But you can look at the graphs, you can look at the scientific plots, and you can see how the populations or the functionalities start way over here. And then over time, they're gradually moving closer and closer to the same kinds of functionalities and characteristics that you would have in a natural marsh that's been undisturbed for, let's say, 50 years. So it's getting there, but it takes time. The other thing, though, that's really important is that with sea level rising, the highest priority for managing our salt marshes is to provide them with what we call accommodation space. They need space within which they can migrate as sea level continues to rise, right? There are still a few people out there who are debating whether or not sea level is rising. Um, I suppose there are also people out there debating whether the earth is flat. There are probably also people out there debating whether, um, I don't know, the Toronto Maple Leafs will ever win another Stanley Cup. You can choose your thing to debate, right? I think the Toronto Maple Leafs will eventually win another Stanley Cup. Maybe not in my lifetime, but it'll probably happen statistically. Likewise, I think most of us who've been up in a plane or whatever would agree that the earth is not in fact flat. It is in fact round. So, you know, sea levels rising, it's going to continue to rise. So if we provide accommodation space for our marshes, they will keep up. Um, I've interacted over the years with a number of people who've said, look, sea levels rising, we're going to lose all of our marshes. Well, from a scientific perspective, sea level has been rising in New Brunswick for over 5,000 years. 5,000 years ago, you could walk to PEI. There was no water in what is now the Northumberland State. <laughs> so if marshes were not going to exist because sea level was going to rise, we wouldn't have marshes now. And for that matter, we wouldn't have sand dunes or beaches either, right? We have these in our environment, but they do have to move. So if, again, if you build the dikes, right on the edge and you give them no place to migrate, you're essentially ensuring that they in fact probably then won't survive because they've got no place to go. So that's my conclusions. That really um, is all I have to say in terms of a formal presentation. Um, I 
think I have one more slide. Yes, I have my ubiquitous uh, um, sunset slide here where, where we can look out over what was the early restoring marsh um, at, at Olac. And I, you know, with that, I'm happy to have a, a, a conversation and maybe guide the rest of what I might say based on what you're interested in or the questions that you have or what you'd like to, uh, to find out about. So I don't know whether M or somebody wants to moderate or people just want to turn their microphones on and ask a question, but I'm open to discussion. Yeah, I can certainly moderate if anyone has any questions that they want to either raise their hand or paste it in the chat and I can read it off to Dr. Allerhead. Um, yeah, just uh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just looking at the chat quickly myself. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, Jeff, uh, Marilyn Lurch uh, here. Um, always the question is, um, science does its, its work. <clears throat> and then government um, it makes its plans uh, which override uh, the, the science. And so at some point, you know, people in the community or region have to get involved. And I guess my question is a simple one or, or not simple, but, you know, how, how, how can the community, how can individuals collectively get together to, um, uh, to help the science and to help um, government see what science should be is suggesting and, and what is different? So I'm going to say three things about that. One, as scientists, we've been trained not to get involved in the what should we do. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's how scientists are trained, because then it seems like you're coming at everything with a preconceived bias about you know what we should do. So we're supposed to be objective. So we're trained to say, to answer that question by saying, well, I don't know, that's up to society. I can tell you what the science is. And one of the examples I used to use was seatbelts, right? The science tells you unequivocally that wearing a seatbelt is safer. Um, you can always find an example where, you know, a one in a thousand chance where not wearing a seatbelt would be the safer option. But that's balanced by 999 times when it is the safer option. So the science tells you that wearing a seatbelt is safe. But then whether legislatures choose to pass laws saying you have to wear a seatbelt or that you can have freedom of choice, that's the thing. So that's number one. Number two, climate change is the thing that's come along where I think a lot of people uh, in the scientific community have decided that we can't necessarily adhere to that model in all cases because it's just too important. It's just too big to say, well, I have no opinion. Um, and I guess I've now been persuaded to that view is, you know, I can't just go into these things and say, well, it's up to society to decide to do. I know full well that if we don't do something, you know, the consequences are going to be, um, you know, in some cases, probably difficult even to imagine how difficult the consequences could be. I will say, by the way, this isn't generally about shoreline erosion. This is about things like global migration of climate refugees and food security, like you know, again, I'm honest, I do shoreline stuff, but really shoreline stuff is like down about number 18 on a list of your top 20 things to worry about as a result of climate change. Now, that said, if you don't want to waste your money, the thing that bugs me about the Shignecto Isthmus report is it's just standard engineering, right? Which in some cases is going to be needed. And if you look at the Saxby Gale and you model the Saxby Gale, which was over 150 years ago, if, that, if, the, if things happen to coincide and we got the exact same storm right now, the water is coming over the dikes and it's coming over more than half the dikes. The current system would not sustain it. So do we need to do something? Absolutely. The thing that's so disappointing about that report is that it doesn't embrace any other options other than just rebuild the dikes. Mm -hmm. And then the third piece is, um, and those who know me, you know, I sometimes make um, poor choices about my analogies about running out and, you know, clothing optional and eating granola and living in the woods. But the whole point is, you don't have to be a stark raving green to embrace other options. 
right? It's pure and simple economics that having salt marsh in front of your dike should reduce your maintenance costs. It's pure and simple economics that if you can sell the carbon credits, you can help to pay for these projects. So instead of the taxpayers of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and the federal government, hey, wait a sec, we're all taxpayers to all those levels of government, right? Instead of having to pay uh, out of pocket for all these dike um, improvements, we could leverage other markets where they're selling carbon credits, US, European markets, we can get them to help pay for this project. So it's not just about the art or it's not just about providing habitat. Those things are wonderful. I love my art that has my marshes. I love looking out at the marshes. But even if you're just a crass economist, this makes sense. And so I think that is another thing where, you know, I don't know, what can you do? Um, join EOS, um, join uh, any other um, environmental organization, but don't just join environmental organizations. And I say that with love because I'm a member of EOS. But the reality is that sometimes, again, when people hear environmental, they just go, nah, 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 because, okay, it's just the environmentalists raving about this. So when I talk to government, I point out it doesn't matter whether I vote green, liberal, or conservative. That's up to me. I know how I vote. But frankly, you know, get politically active. Um, join an organization. But don't just push the green agenda. Push the sensible agenda, which is that we're all in this together. And the final thing, I know I'm talking too much. But I remember um, ill-advisedly perhaps, but I've started doing it now, and I hope not ill-advisedly, about 15 years ago, um, somebody stood up at the back of the room and said, well, tell me then, what do we need to do to save the planet? And I said, without thinking, you don't have to save the planet, you only have to save your own ass. Um, and I don't say that with any hesitation anymore, because again, I'm a geoscientist. Right? I understand that the planet will be just fine. We can have all out nuclear war. And in about 4 million years, all remnants of that will be gone. The planet will continue. It will be fine. The cockroaches will be very happy. This is not about the planet. The planet has survived all kinds of catastrophes over millions of years, right? This is about the human species, our children, our grandchildren, our friends, our relatives, our families. This is about people. And so that's the last thing I would say is, you know, you got to get active because this is about um, people making sensible decisions about working with nature instead of continually trying to work against nature. And all we're going to do if we rebuild the dikes right on the edge or if we build um, that giant water control structure at the mouth of the Tantramar River, which is also one of the proposed things, like we just spent $120 million to take out the control structure on the Petakodiak River. Really? We would build, we would spend tens of millions of dollars to build a new water control structure at the mouth of the Tantramar because we're so good at figuring these things out. End of sermon. Great answer. I don't know if you saw in the chat, Lauren has a question. She was wondering if a salt marsh that has been paved over could be restored. I guess you can restore anything um, with money, but one of the reasons that we've been pushing over the last 10 years at least for a strategic dike management plan is that, you know, again, resources are limited. You got to go after the things that are easiest um, to fix. And again, you also have to be prepared for the realities of, you know, people. Uh, and so an example that I sometimes use is places like Oregon where you might say, well, gee, it would be great if they would preserve all the coastal dunes and not let people with four-wheel drive vehicles and ATVs drive on the dunes. Okay, well, in Oregon, they've said, you know what? Let's get realistic. Nobody will support us if we simply say nobody can drive on the dunes for any reason. So instead, they've set aside an area of, uh, you know, whatever it is, a kilometer, kilometer and a half long, where people can drive their ATVs up and over the dunes. You know, the balance is another stretch of coastal dunes that are completely protected. And so they give people a place to recreate, right? And that's, I would say the same thing, you know, is it worth taking out pavement? In some cases, it's probably not worth it. There are other ways to spend the money to get a bigger bang for the buck in terms of preserving the marshes that are already in jeopardy or in terms of compensating. Again, I, again, I buy my 
Well, I'll, I'll use a, a, a prime example. There's a bad choice of words. Uh, but a prime example is, you know, I buy my beef from a local entrepreneur, farmer at the Sackville market. They graze their cattle on the salt marshes. So you are on the, you know, pasture land that could be turned into salt marsh. So you can't just say, oh, let's turn all the, the pasture land back to salt marsh without thinking about, you know, again, the social economic consequences. How much land would you have to take? Well, not all of it. So, you know, but how would you compensate those people who make their living from those dike lands? You've got to think about that. You can't just say, well, sorry, too bad. Um, but it would also offer a controlled way to do it because if you do nothing, the do nothing option means that if you get a Saxby Gale, it's not going to do anybody any good because all those lands are going to be flooded um, anyway. And if it happened to occur when there was cattle grazing, then you'd probably lose your cattle too, just as they did in the Saxby Gale. So again, I'm a realist. You know, I think we need a strategic plan that is a combination of, of approaches. In some cases, yeah, just raise and reinforce the dike. In other cases, just totally let it go, walk away from it. In other cases, relocate the dikes, but put new salt marshes out in front. Think about it strategically in terms of what the goals are and that give the broadest set of benefits to the broadest cross-section of, of society. Okay, um, Brittany has a question as well. She's wondering what makes a site ideal for salt marsh restoration in your opinion? Um, so one of the things that makes a salt marsh restoration site ideal is um, how long it's been out of tide. Um, and I say that's a, that actually ironically is a purely economic thing, which is because the longer it's been out of tide, the lower it is, which means the more volume it has that it can take up sediment and store carbon. So if you're actually looking to get carbon credits, the more space you can fill, the more carbon you can store and the more credits you can get. So um, one criterion would be, you know, how much volume is there to fill? The second criterion would be, um, you know, how expensive is, is it gonna be to uh, maintain the dikes around it? So where, you've got a relatively short dike um, to take care of, you know, maybe that's not an ideal site where you've got a lot of dike for a relatively small amount of land to protect. That's a good candidate for restoration. And then after that, there's just, you know, practical things. How many landowners are we talking about? Or how willing are those landowners to think about changing the land use in return for compensation of some type? practicalities, how easy or difficult is it to get in natural, uh, is it to get in heavy equipment if you need to bring in heavy equipment? Um, so there's sort of a descending order of things that would make a salt uh, a place, a good location for salt marsh. I will say though, you know what, with 80% of our salt marshes, at least on the fundy side, having been taken out of tide, it's, it, you know, finding sites for the next uh, 10 years is not a challenge. There are a multitude of sites that would be good candidates for salt marsh restoration. Um, yeah, great question. Um, if anybody was wondering about the Saks v. Yale, Julia just posted something in the chat where you can get a little bit of information about that. Really, really interesting. Um, I used to work um, for Tourism Moncton and we have like a a high water line on the waterfront there that shows where um, the high water line of the storm of the Saxby Gale was so really interesting. Um, does anybody have any other questions, comments, concerns? <laughs> I just posted it in the chat, but I'm curious, uh, in your opinion, Dr. Olerhead, what, what would be the ideal way that the business would look after in the next 20 years? Um, like best case scenario, though, in your scientific opinion, I don't, don't want to <laughs> seem too subjective, but best case scenario? Well, I think the best case scenario would be to, um, the best case scenario would be to do a strategic deck management plan to identify those sections of dike that need to be raised and reinforced, and there really is no other viable option 
for the next 20 years, um, I would immediately start to look at working with landowners to look at places where we can either relocate the dikes or possibly even just walk away from the dikes, um, which doesn't mean you can't using the land. It just means that you got to be prepared that if the big, when the big one comes, not if, but when, the circumstances coincide and there's another major storm that you're then prepared to just walk away from it uh, when that happens. Um, I would also think about, I mean, the transportation corridor is a big thing, but I, you know, one of the things that I find a, a bit of a head scratcher is, you know, there's been talk about, well, should we build bridges or relocate the infrastructure? I'm a little less inclined to do that personally, because I'm not actually sure where technology is going to take us, right? We might, we might not need the same kind of infrastructure in 20 years, certainly not in 50 years. Like we really don't know. So I don't know how much money I would put into relocating the rail line and the road. I might just worry about protecting them for the short stretches where they need to be protected. Um, and then, uh, and then look at, at at doing salt marsh restoration as a, as a short term, uh, well as as a as a as a way to deal with to protect the natural protection thing. I th I think that would be the way to go. I would also be looking to acquire land, as I say, not only for salt marsh restoration, but the other piece to that is to give the marshes um, a place to retreat too. So there are places, not so much on the Fundy side, but on the Northumberland Strait side, there are places where if they don't if the if you keep building roads and don't relocate the roads eventually. Um, so like New Brunswick DOT, for example, could build a plan that says, you know what, instead of spending $26 million this year to resurface and rebuild this road, we're actually going to build a new road, uh, you know, 450 meters inland. And the old road can stay there. But for those of you who've been like around Dorchester Cape, for example, like, you know, you, the road that used to go there, it's gone, right? They relocated the road inland. And the road that you used to go on is now, you, I mean, with an eye of faith, for those who know it, you can kind of see, you know where the road was. Um, you can still read it on the landscape, but for all intents and purposes, that road is gone. So we should be open to, instead of spending money re-putting roads exactly where they are, let's put the new road in, use the old road till it's gone or till it's unsafe and then block it off. But let's start planning for it now, right? Um, the question around would private landowners be able to receive money for carbon offsets if they gave up their land? I, I don't see why not. Most private landowners would probably re rather see the money up front, but like I don't see why not. There's lots of organizations out there. I mean, government should be doing it, but there's other organizations like Ducks Unlimited, like Nature Conservancy, and so on that can be in the business of acquiring land and you know arranging the finances up front and, and then. And then smoothing out the cash flow, for example, over over decades for, for the benefits that those lands provide. So there's lots of ways to do it. All it takes is creativity. But again, I will say you got to work in teams, right? I'm not an economist. I'm not a policy person, right? I'm a scientist. But then let's get somebody on the team that's a policy person or an economist or whatever to work out those you know, those kinds of, of, of details and trade-offs. The thing that bothers me about the Shignecto Isma study is that it just doesn't even go into those areas. And even the media coverage for that focus mostly on, it's gonna cost this much, 200 million, 300 million to build. Okay, but go in that report and actually look at the operating costs, right? Because it's not just what it costs to build it, it's $11 million a year-ish, every year in perpetuity to run it. And that assumes that the costs don't go up. Well, with rising sea level and increasing storm intensity, it's almost unimaginable that your costs don't go up over time. So, you know, if you're if you're burning eleven million dollars a year, or if you put it in today's, if you assume some sort of an increase, call it twelve million dollars a year, or fifteen million dollars a year. Well, at fifteen million dollars a year, that means in twenty years you've already spent more on maintenance than it costs your original estimate to build the thing. So it's not just about the economics of building it, it's the economics of maintaining it in perpetuity. Because sea level is not going back down again anytime soon.
Any other questions? I don't want to take up too much space, but I am curious um, where people or where you see models work really well of uh, carbon offsets or people restoring marshes so that we could look for good examples. <laughs> so I would say I would say California is a jurisdiction where um, carbon credits and a carbon market is working. Um, Certainly some of the European countries, uh, Netherlands, uh, Germany, and so on, there's good examples of how the carbon markets are working. Again, beyond my area of actual expertise. Um, I will say though that uh, the Netherlands are doing some really interesting um, kinds of projects with marsh restoration. Um, places where the population densities are high relative to you know, the amount of land available. I mean, that's another thing that you sometimes hear again, and I don't, I don't want to show any disrespect. Um, but, you know, I do hear things like, well, we can't, we can't give any of this land back to the sea because it's just too valuable. The land is too valuable. Well, okay, but you go to the UK and the Netherlands where arguably the land is 10 times more expensive because of the population density and so on. And they are, going there doing salt marsh restoration. They are looking at places where they are calculating that the long-term costs of maintaining the dike system is just simply too expensive if you look out over 50 years and saying, okay, it's still less expensive to compensate the landowners over some period of time, move the agricultural or the activities, whatever they are, in some cases, even um, housing or, or that sort of thing, and saying it's just gonna be cheaper in the long run to move these housing developments or move the land, uh, the agricultural function, and and work on restoring the land back to. So I would look to Germany. I would look to the Netherlands to a certain extent to the UK um, for examples of marsh restorations that are are pushing the boundaries. Um, I would also look to um, California and some European countries as examples of where carbon credits are are are, are working. And I also, by the way, a few people say, well, yeah, but if we get more, if we get more uh, renewable energy and electric vehicles and so on, then this won't be a thing. Uh, again, I don't believe it. Um, I've seen nothing that suggests, well, because I've seen nothing that suggests that there will be alternatives for things like a transatlantic air travel. Like, I, I just don't see what it's gonna be. I mean, moving freight with trucks is stupid. Uh, Long haul trucking, there's no reason why that shouldn't be on electrified rail. But by the same token, few people are going to be willing to get on a boat um, and go across the Atlantic. They're going to want to fly. So there's going to be a need for the foreseeable future um, to burn fossil fuels for certain kinds of things for which there really isn't a viable alternative, which means there's going to be a market for carbon capture and storage. Again, I sometimes hear, oh, there's, that, that's dumb, carbon capture and storage. No, there's going to be a need for some carbon capture and storage. It's just to scale it up. To solve all problems is unrealistic, but for those niche things, marsh restoration, carbon storage in marshes, other kinds of carbon capture and storage, I think there's going to be a market for that for the next hundred years as we get our way off of fossil fuels. We're not getting off fossil fuels immediately unless there's a technological miracle, in which case, great, let's all go have a glass of wine and, and, uh, and we'll enjoy our technological miracle. It's still, by the way, to maybe to pull this back together again, though. Marsh magic. So what? Maybe we don't need marshes anymore for carbon capture and storage because we've solved our, all of our energy problems. It still won't change the fact that we need our marshes for protection from sea level rise and storms because those happened 150 years ago with the Saxby Gale. So we still want marshes for that. We still want marshes as habitat. We still want marshes for recreation. And finally, we still want marshes so that our poets and our painters and our photographers can enjoy the natural beauty that is marshes, just like mountains or just like any other landscape. So again, I see marshes as being, you know, all the kinds of things I'm talking about. Carbon capture and storage is just the thing that's got everybody's attention finally. And it's, it, it shows a way that the economics, the crass economics could be put to work 
in terms of our response to climate change. But even if we solve all that in the next 20 years, all the other things don't go away. Sea level does not stop rising. We have already bought ourselves a minimum of 200 years of sea level rise. And just to cheer you up, because the land that we're on is sinking as a result of iso isostatic subsidence, sea level here is gonna continue to rise for at least the next thousand years. Like the rate might slow down. It will slow down if we stop warming the climate. But you know, we still have to contend with sea level rise for the next foreseeable 500 years of human, of human history in this, in this area. So you know, all the other magic that marshes do still hold regardless of whether we use them for carbon capture. So there you go. There's my, there's my take. <laughs>